develop a STEM culture. I think that if you thinking about STEM, you want to grasp that and get that into your setting. You really need to think about a STEM culture. We must resist the temptation to dismiss children's contributions as wrong. All contributions are valid. Um, we should, however, note the misconceptions that some of the children might have so that we can sensitively address them through encouragement and modeling. Children's knowledge increases um, if you encourage them to reflect. And if, they, and if they want, allow them to change their minds. Children, um, quite often when we work with them, we will um, find out what their prior knowledge is and they might have some ideas about something. But actually, when they work with those activities, um, they realise that some of the things they thought aren't quite what they thought they were. So encouraging children to be able to be reflective and changing their mind is, is very important. When children are actively learning through self-chosen activities, tune into the times to extend STEM thinking. Um, be mindful not to hijack the play. Don't bombard children with hundreds of questions to meet your goal, um, but do look out for opportunities to extend and challenge in everyday situations. It's lovely to see so many of you on the call this morning. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, Today, we're going to be discussing a topic that is seems to be really, really topical in settings at the moment. It's STEM, um, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And we have two amazing speakers, which I'll introduce to you um, in a moment. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, if everybody can remain on mute, that really helps our speakers to concentrate. And as always, the recording of this session, together with the presentations, of the speakers and any other useful resources that we'll discuss in the session will be sent to you after the session. Um, as I said, we're gonna be covering STEM today and we have two fantastic uh, industry experts with us, Deborah Parfit and Gina Bale, and both of them are gonna be delving into this vital part um, of the children's learning and demonstrate um, the technicalities of STEM, but also with a bit of creativity and effort, we can actually help the children develop a lifelong love of STEM. So quick, a uh, quick introduction to Deborah and Gina. Um, Deborah uh, set up and is currently the manager of Cambridge's first STEM day nursery. It's called Shelford Day Nursery. And she's also worked across the earlier sector for, for about 35 years. In fact, over 35 years, I think. Um, she's previously led the nursery provision within a primary school setting from new to outstanding within a whole year of opening. And she's gained her BA honors in early childhood studies and an early years professional. Um, her philosophy is fostering natural curiosity through high quality, appropriately challenging experiences that take account of children's individuality and differing learning styles. That sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> um, regarding Gina, Gina created her baby, as she calls it, Little Magic Dragon in 2002, which is a multi-sensory uh, movement-based learning platform that takes children on magical adventures and engages them so that they're curious and ready to learn about the world around them. Gina's background is in ballet and she received her qualifications from the Royal Ballet School, Trinity College and the Royal Academy of Dance. And she's taught music uh, movement, including ballet at vocational schools for over 28 years as well as creating dance programmes for various TV channels and cultural events. So between them, they'll be discussing all things STEM. Deborah's going to start and she will be discussing how the STEM approach fits in with the EYFS, the gradual development of core skills, child initiated and adult led learning. And also it's not all about just doing activities. And Gina will be discussing artistic versus science brain, why we need to nurture imagination and curiosity for STEM and engaging the little ones in early science, technology, engineering and maths. So lots to cover. The presentations are really good. So over to you, ladies. I know, Deborah, you're going to start. I'm Deborah Parfit. Um, thank you, uh, Gail, for my introduction. Uh, it's covered my background really, really well. So although I have had 36 years experience working in the early years, I've been particularly focused on STEM over the last 14 months. And I've been part of the foundry team for Cambridge's first purpose-built STEM-focused nursery, Shelter Day Nursery. And this has been a really exciting part of my journey to date because STEM provision is something I'm really um, passionate about. So I've got a, a lot for you today. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the learning intentions for the session. Okay. 
So today's objectives, understanding how STEM maps across the EYFS, uh, facilitating STEM learning through adult interaction, learning about STEM inquiry types and skills, and using the STEM approach in everyday provision. STEM subjects have attracted a lot of attention recently uh, with pressure on secondary schools to have more pupils leaving with strong results in STEM. Um, this has kind of filtered down through the primary sector um, in, in the recent uh, months and years. Um, and as early as practitioners, we really know that actually the foundations for learning need to be strong um, in uh, the early years section if primary school phase is going to be successful. So hence really the investment from government um, in good early years provision through the funding system. So why not start building that strong foundation for STEM as well? Um, foundations in the early years in STEM make sense. So what is STEM? It's, uh, it's cross-curricular uh, approach. It involves science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, it's inherent in all the early years development areas and enhances really good early years provision. The STEM approach really dovetails beautifully with the EYBS, and I think I wanted to cover that uh, in more detail through the session today. Um, we um, just need to um, pick it a little bit so that you can see what areas of the EYFS and, and how STEM fits into that. Into that. Um, the STEM skills and attributes provide the foundations for children's futures, preparing children for successful adult careers. And because STEM really involves children thinking for themselves, problem solving and testing and adapting their ideas, it facilitates confidence, maturity and resilience. Um, all of something I think everybody would agree that they want um, their children to develop. But let's have a peek at each of the areas. Let's think about the core skills involved with science, um, the ability to ask probing questions, uh, working collaboratively with peers and adults, thinking creatively, solving problems, exploring and taking calculated risks, testing solutions to problems and discovering new or alternate ways of doing things. But they're really the core skills that the science um, is going to develop. Technology, that involves applying the scientific knowledge for practical purposes, um, especially in industry. Technology is more than just computers. Uh, it includes time to investigate, test and learn about machines, for example, things like slopes, wheels and axles, levers, pulleys and screws, all the sort of things, the technologies that are frequently seen in your early years setting, they're often activities that are set up for children in an early years environment. Engineering involves designing, building, problem uh, finding, problem solving, adapting, improving, visualizing, collaborating, reflecting, resourcefulness, resilience and curiosity, and a lot of open-mindedness. It is a cycle uh, of identifying a problem, solving the problem, adapting and improving designs, finding things that work, and then generally trying to make them work better. Now, maths, um, that's probably the area that you're all most familiar with. Um, maths is the part that holds it all together and helps us to make sense of everything. Uh, maths is defined as making a calculation or coming to a conclusion based on a relevant practical figure. It involves numbers, shapes, logic and quantity. So when we're considering how those STEM areas map across the EYFS, um, one of the most important parts for me, I feel, are the characteristics of effective teaching and learning, because um, they are obviously how children learn best. STEM develops critical thinking, curiosity, innovation, problem solving and decision making. STEM involves children playing and exploring and having a, a go at things. It is active learning and it involves cheap people, children keeping on trying um, when things don't go as planned. Um, all of the things that we know well to be characteristics, STEM is also all of those things. It's really hard to think of STEM learning without thinking of this area in the EYFS. STEM also can't really be separated from understanding the world. Um, it is exploratory learning. Everything children naturally do during their times at nursery, right from babies onwards, involves exploring the environment to make sense of the world. It's hands-on learning and observation of others and the real world because that's how children learn best. 
When we move on and think about personal, social and emotional development, it's again enhanced by a STEM approach. STEM is often collaborative and it supports children to develop a positive sense of themselves because it involves them setting simple goals um, and develop their confidence and their abilities through those, setting themselves goals that they can achieve. So when you engage in STEM thinking, children need to persist at things. Failure is just a learning opportunity and perseverance helps overcome setbacks. Children learn there may be many ways to do things and everyone's ideas and contributions need to be respected. STEM curriculum also encompasses learning about health and environmental factors affecting the world in which they live. For example, um, just recently we've had some activities around uh, making our own recycled paper. Um, this has really engaged children with concepts such as protecting our planet and recycling, as well as exploring how materials can be changed. So um, it all fits in uh, the environmental factors um, linking in with PSED. Physical development in itself, um, STEM um, by its very nature in the early years is play-based and hands-on. So as children explore the natural world and manipulate a range of tools in their inquiries, they'll engage in both growth and fine motor skill. There's an opportunity for developing language through STEM. Um, it's endless. Children learn a range of new vocabulary when you're engaging with STEM concepts. Um, they learn this vocabulary in context and as part of first-hand experiences, as well as some specific STEM concept words that uh, tend to be more adult initiated um, and added into what they're doing. Children use language to communicate their ideas, predict outcomes and share their findings. All of this underpins the development of literacy. So children will use books to research ideas and engage in mark making to record results and they'll use mark making to communicate their ideas and their predictions. So STEM links nicely across the literacy. If we take mathematics again just at this moment and think about what does the EYFS say about maths? It says developing a strong grounding in number is essential so that all children develop the necessary building blocks to excel mathematically. And STEM obviously has a strong focus on maths. It develops arts and um, the expressive arts and design. Children draw up designs and plans. They record what they notice in the environment over time. The EYFS specifically states that the quality and the variety of what children see here and participate in is crucial for de developing their understanding, self-expression, vocabulary, and the ability to communicate through the arts. So as you can see, the EYFS links beautifully in here um, for STEM learning and STEM thinking again. STEM is about hands-on cross-curricular learning rather than just knowing facts. It's not a fact-finding thing in the early years, hands-on play-based learning. Okay, so how do we make that happen? Much, much research has been carried out in relation to the importance of the adult interactions to enhance learning, including long longitudinal studies such as the EPI project, which many of you will know about. Um, we know learning's at its best during high quality conversations with tuned in and respectful adults. So supporting um, STEM in the early years requires skilled practitioners to interact with the children, to enable them to start developing their higher order thinking, to develop the knowledge that they need and to be able to do something with what they know, as as they are supported to remember, understand and apply their knowledge on this emerging journey. To analyze and evaluate as they progress through the education system. So all of those STEM skills uh, emerge over time with practitioners interacting in a way which supports them. Evidence also shows that educators believe that children get better quality interactions in school rather than at home, but actually for often the reverse of that is true. So we really need to focus on how we interact with children to make sure that they get those quality interactions. We need to consciously consider our interactions with children so that we can sensitively enhance children's learning rather than hijack their play. So we need to plan to teach STEM vocabulary and pitch words that we teach at the right level. So many of you will be familiar with Goldilocks words and the Goldilocks analogy is really useful here. 
So ensure the words that you choose are the right words for each child, uh, not too easy. They're the ones that children generally know and can use. Uh, not too hard, those subject specific uh, words that are not used very often and abstract. Although we might drop those in when we're doing particular STEM focused concepts, because introducing to children to a range of words in context um, means that that is in their grasp. When we often um, don't consider teaching children, we don't worry about teaching children words like Tyrannosaurus Rex. So why not add in some um, words linked to STEM, such as predict and observe. Children will learn them if they're in concept. Okay. So you need to picture words that are just right. They're usually words that are within children's zone of proximal development. And, and many of you will know that that is the area that children can reach with the right support from an adult. So that's really important to plan to teach the STEM language. We need to build children's science capital, help them to know that they are being scientists by telling them. Tell them when they're being a scientist. Tell them when they're being an engineer or a mathematician. Help them to develop the idea that they can be those things. That's really important. We should know what vocabulary we hope the children will learn during their hands-on learning. And it's not always straightforward. We need to consider which vocabulary is appropriate as well as developmentally relevant. So let's have a look at that then. Let's have a look at some examples. Um, or, or STEM questions and things. It's not just the STEM provocations that you set up that make high quality STEM. Any activity without appropriate interaction will not deliver the intended outcomes. So when we look at the STEM questions, we also have to consider uh, which are the right ones to use at the time. STEM questions are open-ended, carefully picked, carefully placed, and we need to balance asking the right questions with the periods of silence, observation, and, and mix them in with some narration of play so we don't bombard children with questions. But often as adult practitioners, there's a temptation when you've got a, a gender and a goal to sit down and just ask question after question after question. It's important that the questions are the right questions and placed in the right time as you interact with children. That way we can skillfully support the emerging learning as it goes along. The blank level questions you can see in this slide give you examples of, quest of question progression with the level four questions often not being mastered to the end of the early years foundation stage. And for some children, that won't be until key stage one. So you have to think, remember that the why questions and the how questions are often very related to um, STEM learning, need to be supported and modeled. They're often used in STEM questions, so they need to be accompanied also by fun, play-based, hands-on experiences to support them to be meaningful though, for those that are ready. Take the time um, when you work with the children to know where they are in terms of their ability to understand a question and make sure most of the questions um, that you use are within that child's grasp. And then at the right moment, you can stretch the children up to the next level by dropping in questions from the level above. Um, children need to be really well supported when they develop their understanding of, of, of questions, particularly those that are how and why. As you can see on here, you know, a lot of the questions um, don't start with what. They are how and they are why questions, but they need to be in context. Develop a STEM culture. I think that if you thinking about STEM, you want to grasp that and get that into your setting, you really need to think about a STEM culture. We must resist the temptation to dismiss children's contributions as wrong. All contributions are valid. Um, we should, however, note the misconceptions that some of the children might have so that we can sensitively address them through encouragement and modeling. Children's knowledge increases um, if you encourage them to reflect. And if, they, and if they want, allow them to change their minds. Children, um, quite often when we work with them, we will um, find out what their prior knowledge is and they might have some ideas about something, but actually when they work with those activities, um, they realize that some of the things they thought aren't quite what they thought they were. So encouraging children to be able to be reflective and changing their minds is, is very important. When children are actively learning through self-chosen activities, tune into the times to extend STEM thinking. Um, be mindful not to hijack the play. Don't bombard children with hundreds of questions to meet your goal, um, but do look out for opportunities to extend and challenge in everyday situations. 
So let's take a look um, at the different um, inquiry types uh, and skills. First of all, let's have a look at the inquiry types. Um, well, something that I think is really easy to do in an earlier setting is observing over time. Um, observing over time can be long or short. It can be seconds or months, um, such as observing um, seasonal change. I like short change. It's great for uh, facilitating making predictions. Um, fun activities such as like soaking a gingerbread man in water to see what happens to him. People really like that type of thing. And you get reasonably instant results to see him start to um, dissolve. Identifying and classifying is also great for noticing um, similarities and difference, um, an area that's often thought about as part of the UIFS. Grouping items by simple, easily observable characteristics such as colour, size, shape and pattern, really, really easy to do. And pattern seeking can be delivered creatively too. Um, that's great in the forest, going out and having looking for patterns in nature. Um, it's also good for making predictions. Hmm, do big cars go faster? Hmm, I wonder. And how are you going to test it? But when we look at comparing and testing, it's unlikely that in the early years foundation stage, we're going to be uh, touching on fair testing. Um, but you could model and suggest things such as, you know, placing all the cars in the same starting place when you roll them down the slope. Um, I think fair testing uh, skill will develop with maturity. Uh, it's not something that our early years children have really a grasp of, um, making things fair. You could compare things as well, such as um, which material is best to keep a toy animal dry in a shelter, for example. Um, children might build something and then you might be able to see, um, test it out to see whether the materials they've used um, keep the animal dry. You can use a whole load of different materials to test that out. Um, you can also test things like, OK, we've got dry sand. So how much water do we need to add to our dry sand to make a sand castle stick together? So there's lots of little things that you can do in your everyday provision um, that link really nicely. I think when we use researching, we should model and use non-fiction books and the internet in response to the inquiries and questions that arise as you play and learn with children in the moment. I think that's where they're most valid. STEM skills, on the other hand, when adults are interacting with children in their day-to-day -day play, either following their interests and fascinations or taking part in adult-initiated um, provocations, we need to make time for children to develop their abilities to share their ideas, uh, make predictions and plan their investigations. You can skillfully use children's fascinations to facilitate STEM learning. Um, for example, uh, when the first group of nursery children started at our nursery, they were all massively into superhero play, um, in particular Spider-Man. There were pretend webs being fired here, there and everywhere. You can imagine, can't you? That's really exciting for, for the children. So we just tapped into this um, and did lots of work around spiders, spiders' webs, patterns. We looked at the concept of sticky, stickier and stickiest. And what made something sticky? How could we make a sticky substance? How could we test which one was the stickiest? Um, and the children were introduced to the language of investigation, prediction and testing all alongside their child-led um, learning. Um, it was not something, some elaborate adult inspired activity which made this high quality STEM uh, learning experience. It was the interactions the practitioner had with the child, which were pitched at the right level and at the right time that made it a high quality STEM learning experience. So testing the stickiest encouraged the children to observe, notice and suggest a result. So even in simple activities, those STEM skills um, can come to the front. So it's not all about elaborate activities. You can use your existing provision to make the most of STEM learning experiences. So all sorts of gimmicky STEM activities are out there and they're great fun too. You can, you know, they're great fun to do. Things like walking rainbows, rain clouds, making bath bombs, doing the elephant toothpaste experiment. Uh, you know, they, are, they all are great fun. But STEM doesn't have to be something extra, some elaborate adult initiated activity. Great places to start thinking about STEM are really through stories, your forest sessions, block play, mud kitchens, um, water play, sand and gravel play, and um, a particular favorite in our setting at the moment, junk modeling. Um, 
our current cohort of preschool children have a collective fascination with modelling and particularly spend time joining a range of things using copious amounts of tape. They've engineered endless rockets inspired by our Space Week and they've developed their creative ideas to create a range of models of all different shapes and sizes um, with all different parts of nursery equipment and their home equipment wrapped up within them. Some people have put their most um, precious uh, cuddly toy in, in their models and a lot of the small resources from setting have been added to the things as children have made um, musical instruments and all sorts of other things um, it, it, you know, as a response to junk modelling. Uh, so it's all, all really good um, uh, way to get children involved in early engineering. Block play has also got endless mathematical technology and engineering benefits too, and it appeals to all ages. It's an area where learning is visible over time. If children are afforded uninterrupted time to play, in, in this space, adults should be available to support children and call upon, when children call upon them, rather than um, interrupting their play all the time. Silence in the block play area can be golden, um, and you, do, you can literally see the children learning, both with junk modeling and um, with the block play area. The more time children can spend in those areas, uh, the more they can develop their learning and their STEM thinking. So again, um, making the most of stories. There are endless stories, um, things that have got woodland and parks type themes, growing and life cycle themes, you know, your bear hunt, your red riding hood, buffaloes, thirsty park pe keeper, the hungry caterpillar, they really lend themselves um, to park, woodland, forest, and STEM learning. Um, for, you know, you could you could go on a uh, visit to a wood, uh, great for cultural capital. You can learn about woodland, woodland life, uh, wildlife, find out about bears and wolves, explore footprints, looking at the shapes and patterns, find out about what woodland animals eat and the food chain. You can explore life cycles and growing. Stories really, really are a great starting point for STEM, especially for our younger children. They can be linked to all the areas um, of STEM and, and they are a really great starting point. Visiting a wood regularly in the same place at different times of the year is very STEM. Um, it means it gives you a chance to um, observe over time um, and just look at the changes in that same spot over and over. And using stories as a driver can provide a wealth of STEM learning at different times of the year, um, particularly things like uh, caterpillars and butterflies, life cycle work, also things like ice and snow exploration. Um, that's really good uh, uh, STEM exploration at different times of the year. So stories also support communication and language, which of course is a really big driver in terms of off dead inspections probably. Millions of STEM learning opportunities are right there in our everyday early years activities, things that you're familiar with. Um, so when we look at STEM and we think about exploring change, baking, dough, ice play, mud kitchens, potions, your powder paints, uh, you know, dissolving chalks, using the vinegar and bicarbonate of soda, uh, looking at seasonal change and things like growth and decay, um, all really good for exploring change. Our children have had a couple of ongoing uh, projects in, around that where they've peeled their orange peel off their fruit and it's been busily decaying on the windowsill under, under decay watch for um, quite a few weeks now. And they like looking really, really closely at it as they watch that change. It brings us nicely on to looking at things really closely. Children need to be encouraged to observe things closely. Um, from all sorts of things, like observational drawings, from real tabletop applications, such as a vase of flowers or a painting, using their binoculars, magnifying glasses, bug pots, playing games like odd one out, that can be really good to um, help children to notice and look closely at things. Uh, going on hunts, taking part in an autumn or a spring watch, um, and also providing things like wormeries and growing in glass jars. They often facilitate um, observing change which might not otherwise have been seen for when for example when you plant your broad bean um, in a glass jar so they can see the roots or your you plant something in a glass jar so over time they can emerge um, they can see the roots emerging over time all really good for looking closely at things and it can inspire home learning stem sparks children's curiosity and inspires home learning this lovely parental entry into the child's learning journey was inspired 
by our World Space Week, um, where the children had been particularly taken with moon observations. Uh, this is a boy's mum reports him to leap out of bed to check the moon before he settles to sleep at night. And if he forgets to do it first, he's soon up to have a go. Um, it's still a fascination, even a month later. And now it's dark outside. The children in the nursery can be heard encouraging each other to look out of the window to see the moon independently. So some of the projects and things that you do do really last and stick um, with the children. And it's great to see um, that home learning um, and those children taking that home to their, to their parents. And not to be forgotten, many of the skills and attributes um, attributed to STEM learning require children to be innovative and therefore tap into their creativity through the arts. So this leads me nicely into the handover to Gina, who will transform STEM for us into STEAM. So thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Deborah, thank you so much. That was incredible. I've I've been sent a few questions privately, but we're going to do questions at the end of the at the end of the session because I know Gina's um, Gina's presentation just flows so nicely to yours. But I just while Gina's getting her screen ready, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, yeah, incredible. Lots and lots of notes here. <laughs> Gina, over to you. Myself, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Deborah. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. And I was going, oh, there's so much you can do in there. But when you said the wormery, it made me wince. I remember when my daughter came home saying, we're going to have a wormery. We need a wormery. So I went and ordered one for her. Guess what happened? They all escaped. <laughs> Oh, it still makes me feel, but it was really good fun. She really enjoyed it. Um, and I was so happy it wasn't an ant farm because I have a thing about ants. So yeah, I, I, that really was lovely. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So what I want to do is I'm just going to introduce the A in STEM, sort of turning it into STEAM because you can't do science, technology, engineering and math without being creative, as you have just demonstrated so beautifully with your um, presentation. And my name's Gina. I'm the creator of Little Magic Train. And um, we're all about imagination, role play. As you're saying in your presentation that the best way for children to learn is guidance and conversations with the adults we use we have the same policy we like to guide them a little bit and then they they free flow they go into their own child-led environments it's giving that little bit of guidance because some children do need a little bit more than others so i'm going to start with my first slide i hope you can see it oh, i got it right is that working yes yay <laughs> um right the artistic versus the science brain um, I'm sure you've seen all the newspaper reports how the arts are being cut in secondary schools and arts and humanities don't seem to have any value anymore in the world. And actually, they are very, very wrong in that regard. Without that creativity, that artistic part of the brain, you would not have the innovation that we have today. You would not have people like Elon Musk. <laughs> He is insane, but I have to love him. <laughs> so you need somebody who can dream and can see and visualize. Um, there's a fabulous quote that I found um, from Einstein that he said, the greatest scientists are artists as well. So the greatest innovators are artistic and scientific. And in fact, they um, the artistic brain and the scientific brain, they don't tiptoe around they do great big leaps into the unknown they have leaps of faith and there's so much research coming out now showing that you need to in include and have the artistic side and the creative side in that stem which is why we've got the thing of stem v steam um but watching your presentation i it is it's absolutely Perfect. It really made me go, yay, um, Deborah. It was absolutely lovely. So that, that there is really no difference. Um, people feel that scientists scientists are a bit rigid. They're more convergent, and the artists are more divergent in their thinking. And to be able to innovate, 
they need to, the scientists need to be divergent to join the dots that nobody else can find to come up with that, that um, solution to a problem, which is what your children are doing all day long in settings. And what I'm going to sort of talk about now is how we are going to springboard that imagination, take them out of the real world into the imaginary world where anything is possible. There are no boundaries. We can take them in a rocket to the moon. You can take them under the sea. They can build their own submarine. Think of all that fun, Deborah, of making submarines to see what would float, what doesn't float, how long it would take for the little person in there to drown. All these fun things you can have. I still remember as a child, my, I had Barbies. I didn't have a TV till 1976. I grew up in a place I didn't have TV. I can hear people going, Ugh, no television. I used to get my Barbies. I made parachutes and I used to chuck them out the window to see how many I, how many legs I would break in the process. I was a lovely child. <laughs> Just to give you an idea, I was experimenting whilst dressing my Barbie. So I was doing a combination of both. So the artistic and the science brain, they are so similar. Please don't think, oh, that child's creative and artistic. We're not going to think about the science technology because you do see children being pigeonholed. And actually you would be surprised what they will, how you can sort of set that spark into the science with that little bit of creativity. It's really important that children aren't pigeonholed. And I do see it a lot. I know even today, it's really sad. And I know none of you would do that, but it does happen. People will just do it automatically. So some fabulous quotes from, um, again, Einstein, the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. So you need to have that imagination to build those rockets, to do all the, the gingerbread and the water and all these things that you are doing, Deborah. So you need that creativity and imagination. Your brain must be exceptionally creative without even realizing. Um, then we've also got, of course, Bill Gates. Creativity allows people to be effective. So that is the thing. It allows you to join the dots when nobody else sees those dots. Um, and this is why it's so important to, to stimulate and increase the imagination and creativity in children, because you do not know who is sitting in your it's sitting in the floor in front of you. You could have one of the future greatest minds in the world and you just, just give them that little bit of spark of imagination. And then you've got um, Andreas, um, I, I can't even say it, Andreas, I'll just say Andreas. He said, it's our, it will be our imagination, our awareness and our sense of responsibility that will enable us to harness the opportunities of the 21st century to shape the world for the better really important now and he is the director of for education and skills and the special advisor on education policy to the secretary general of the organization for economic cooperation and development in paris and he is absolutely all about the creativity and the imagination alongside and it just science and creativity are one they shouldn't be separated i always give the example of because I, I grew up in a country a long, long way from here. We had a very famous doctor who, I don't know how he ever thought about it. He decided to take the heart out of one person and put it in the other to see what would happen. That's the ultimate in um, exploration. So the first ever heart transplant, that takes a special mind to think, let me do that. And the creativity and the thought process to do that. So I don't see how you can split the artistic and the scientific brain. There is an awful lot of research that is showing that they're very similar. Um, so the ultimate, I think, is da Vinci. If you look at these images, he created the self-supporting bridge, the canal lock, which is still in existence today all over the world. Then you've got the tank. The tank, I love this, the tank he designed was actually superior to the one that they were using the First World War. That just shows how creative and how imaginative he was for all of these things to still be around. And then the double hull. I bet the Titanic wished they'd done that because if they had a double hull, they would not have sunk. So that was, he created that and we ignored it. So all of these things, Da Vinci I think is, the ultimate in the combination of the artist 
and the scientist, he clearly imagined and saw in his head these incredible inventions. Um, and at his, when he was around, they didn't separate art and science like they tend to now. So it was merged together. And that's where you have the most innovative thinking experiments and um, progress for, for humankind. Um, so it's so important for our future to really get those children to become imaginative. And I'm just going to share my next slide. Do, do, do. Oh, wrong way. Oh, yes, here we go. I have a question, but actually you answered it for me beautifully. <laughs> Is STEM an appropriate approach to enhance the level of creativity in children? Absolutely. But I think you need to discover that for yourself rather than having us telling you that. You need to see it yourself. You need to explore this with the children. And once you start to see how these children respond and become creative, you will know that's the only way forward for your children in your setting with the guidance, with the imagination, with the creativity. Um, there are lots of articles, um, the Creative Little Scientist Project, Fostering Children's Creativity Through Preschool, STEM. There's Do the Arts Belong, STEM v STEAM. There, there are all these different research that's going on out there because I can see there seems to be a bit of a, bit of a battle going on v STEM versus STEAM. Um, and to me, it's one and the same thing. Absolutely. Um, and then Howard Gardner has said that every human deserves to learn about the arts and humanities just as they need to know about the science. And in fact, art, creativity, music, movement, all of these things are actually what make us human. You take that away that we are not. We're not us. We're not humans. That is the only difference. Otherwise, we might as well just be AI, <laughs> all of us. You need that creativity. You need that imagination. You need to visualize these things. And that that is imagination, creativity. And it's so important that you nurture that in your little ones from the minute they come into your setting. So um, what we do is we like to um, nurture that creativity and we wrap the STEM that you're doing with the children, it's it's wrapped up within stories, as Deborah was saying, stories and all these different things. We wrap it up for you so it makes life easier. So it's such a nice way for the children to be able to explore and go on and start to look at these early STEM, early science, early technology, early engineering and early math. So for example, I would take the children to China we would arrive in China. So you can imagine you've got all these maps, all these things that they can learn about. They can look at the Great Wall of China. Think of all of that block play you're gonna have with the children. Who can create a better wall? Then you're gonna meet dragons. You can learn about dragons, mythology, and then that can link into all the, the animal. There's just so much fun in there. Um, tigers, did you know that their stripes are different on each side of their body? I know, I learned that only recently. So all these things that the children will learn about, the understanding and knowledge of the world through stories, through imagination, through experiments. We've got my pangolin. I don't know if you can see him. He looks like he's going to belch in a moment. Um, and all the different things you can create and make termite hills, ant hills, find the best way of destroying it to get those ants out, link that to an ant farm. Better than a termite, termite farm, I think, because that would be you may not have any um, wooden doors left um, in your property. Um, and then pandas, you can learn about the endangered species. You can watch bamboo grow. I also found out because I've literally just come back from India and I was given a long lecture about bam how bamboo takes five years underground before it sprouts. So that would be great to do. Day one, when they're born, the parent can plant a bamboo shoot and then over those five years all that foundation all that learning that they're doing is so important before they sprout and go into primary school that to me sums up all of the early years all of the time in nursery you are feeding you are nurturing you're the, you're giving them everything that they need so that when they go to primary they are ready to go so those first five years of their bamboo so it's just very very simple ways of 
getting them to become creative and imaginative. So for example, I loved it. You mentioned dinosaurs. We love to feed in language. Those children know every single name of those dinosaurs. I have to admit, it took me three weeks to be able to say Quetzalcoatlus. They said it instantly. They knew exactly who it was. And I wonder if you know what a Quetzalcoatlus is. I did a survey. I asked, I must have seemed really strange. I was on the train to London going to the Natural History Museum. And there was a whole horde of children with their teachers. So I went to the teacher and I said, can you ask the children which, which dinosaur they're scared of the most? So she surveyed all of the children and they all said pterodactyl. So I was thinking pterodactyl, but that's only teeny tiny. So I went and found the bigger one. The Quetzalcoatlus has a wingspan of 11 meters. Think of all that fun you can have with the children of measuring the pterodactyl to the Quetzalcoatlus. Think of the wings that you could make, trying to see what you can get to fly. You could create lots of little da Vinci's in there for yourself. So these words are perfect. They can learn the dinosaur words. They will know the words for science. So you are getting them ready for everything. You'll create, the, if they can obsess on dinosaurs, let them obsess on science, technology, engineering, and math. That is going to be amazing for them. And actually, if you've got children that obsess on dinosaurs, it actually shows a higher level of um, intellect as well. It's quite interesting. There's been a lot of research on that as well. So just to give you an idea, my dinosaurs, they were playing a little bit too roughly. I don't know if you can see my stegosaurus. We had some consequences. They got stuck together. We had to find a way of pulling them apart, getting them apart without breaking any of the spines. Or da oh dear, here goes the dog. Let me let my dog out one second. Out you go, dog. Oh, out you go. Sorry, I just had to let him out. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sure so you can hear my dog. Ow, oh, there's a delivery person at my door. Shh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like the children running in. <laughs> They'll be quiet in a second. So we had to find a way of getting them apart. And when they came apart, what happened? All of their spikes and all of their plates came off. So we had to get our binoculars out. As you said, Deborah, we need to look at things closely. We got out our binoculars and our magnifying glass and we went around the room picking up the plates and the spikes, items that represented, they weren't the real ones. We used pens, we had pads. We had bags, everything became the, the plates. And we came up with ways of um, the matching, putting things together. They had to count them. We also put masking tape on the floor. We put numbers alongside the masking tape. We put numbers on everything around the room and they had to go and get the matching number. So that all these things in there that you can see will link to your early math as well. We then also had, oh, I can hear my dogs having a little fight out there. I'm ignoring them. We also have my um, Titanosaurus, of course. I love my mummy Titanosaurus. Um, we had to find a way of stopping her. Can you imagine, it would be the equivalent of a 10 ton truck coming at you full pelt. So we had to find ways of stopping her without hurting her because she's also very, very scared. She may be big, but she's also very, very scared and very timid. So you can see how that will also link into the emotions. I want to put E for emotions as well as engineering. <laughs> All these things are very important for your little ones. So we had to come up ways of stopping her. Uh, and also it was a great way of introducing children not to walk in front of cars because they don't always stop. So we had some life lessons in there. So you don't run in front of a great big dinosaur, Titanosaurus, you don't walk in front of a car. Then I'm sure Deb would love this one, the volcano. Oh, think of that fun. All those science experiments. Who can have all those explosions? Yeah, um, I mean, that that would just go on for ages. And we've got here, we've got my, um, we demolish. I can see my panda on the bamboo stilts, but actually my dragons demolished the um, Great Wall of China. So we had to rebuild it. We had to find different ways of building it. We used to get, um, um, what you call, I used to get, I don't know what you call it, the, the flour and water glue, stick it together. We did it with Lego blocks. We had everything they used. Um, we cut up egg boxes and they, they stacked it up together. Then we've also got the mummy titanosaurus egg. So 
texture, size, volume. What happens if you break an egg? What happens if you drop an egg? It breaks. What's inside? You could boil an egg. How, all these things that you can see that will come off this one very simple story with the children. Of course, we have to have space. We build and make our rockets. We look at technology around us. So you, 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 you put it to the level of the child in the room with you. As Deborah says, we scaffolded that learning. We feed in the language, which is the Goldilocks language for the children as well. Snow. I mean, perfect time of year. Look at a snowflake under a magnifying glass. You can freeze one one setting. I wanted to get permission to show you the video today, but we didn't didn't quite didn't quite have the time to get all that permission. I'm afraid. But they um, got the little magic train, and they she put them in ice blocks. She froze them into little ice blocks for the children. We went off to the North Pole. While we were on our adventure in the North Pole, my train decided to do snow angels. And mm, he did rather too many snow angels that he actually became a little block of ice. So they then set up all these different trays around the around the garden for them to find ways of thawing the train so that they could take go home on their journey. So it just links into that imagination. So you're just you're just presenting that the early exploration, the early stem tickets, mark making, making tickets, counting money all these things so you can see how role play will instantly take you into your early stem i'll just take my next slide da, da, da. some food for thought <gasps> think of, you may have some of these people sitting in your room future ones now i don't know if anyone knows who ada lovelace is but she was lord byron's daughter <laughs> she actually created the helped create the prototype for the first computer. Can you imagine that? And she was a woman. See, as I was saying before, creativity and science wasn't split, hadn't been split up then. It was just the one thing. Hedy Lamar, Hedy Lamar, most gorgeous, glamorous. Those of a certain age will remember the hairstyle for her. She had these beautiful waves. She was, she was actually very fascinating. She has largely been ignored probably because she was an actress she was so beautiful and of course being female but she pioneered the technology that is now in our wi-fi gps and bluetooth systems she actually she created the system for the use of frequency hopping to find um the torpedoes to stop them hitting uh, the ships and submarines that's how can you how can you not say creativity and the arts go together with science? I mean, when you start to look at these people, um, okay, we can go through, there's, there's so many. Have a look at these people, find out about them. Of course, we've got Musk down there. We've got Raj, we've got Tu Yu Yu, we've got everyone there. Loads of ones that you know, but I think Ada Lovelace and Hedy Lamar are my standout, amazing females of science. Slightly ignored, but they are there um oh and okay i've rused on i've moved on starfleet i don't know if anyone's a star trek fan i am i'm, I'm if you're a star wars fan i'm really sorry i watch star wars but star trek is the one for me so as they say life imitates art so that creativity comes first this is the big thing. I, I was, um, look, I did put copywriter CBS Studios there. Don't worry, Gail. There it is. It's there. Because <laughs> they are quite scary. Um, did you know quantum teleportation has is actually happening? Only across a few miles. So all this stuff that we've been seeing for the 1960s Starfleet in Star Trek, they, the scientists are trying to do. I, I can't remember. I don't remember if Star, I think Star Trek was before Dungeons and Dragons, I assume, wasn't it? So all these people, these scientists playing their Dungeons and Dragons, they would be watching Star Trek beforehand. I'm so I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Big Bang Theory and Sheldon. I don't know if anyone else watches that. Deborah, yes. <laughs> Do you do experiments on the children? Yes. <laughs> we did them on our flatmate. Um, so then early Star Trek technologies have actually made their way into our everyday lives. Things that these 
artists, these um, writers, these artistic people came up with, they are now our mobile phones. That just says that leap, that innovation. Tricorders are actually MRIs. And only in 2017, a tricorder received a 2.6 million in prize money. This is really happening. All these creative things are really starting to happen. Star Trek, I love this. I do remember this. The crew members used to see, used to see them with what I call iPads years before we had them. So it shows how important the imagination is for STEM, for innovation, for technology. Um, you really cannot take the two apart. And um, I've got a little phrase. I hope that helps. And I feel very I feel very honoured to have followed you, Deborah, because everything that you were saying was everything that made me just go, yes, wrap it up in imagination, wrap it up in creativity, because you don't know who's sitting in front of you. And um, just to help you out, we've got a thank you gift for you. So all you have to do is email and you'll get our toy shop at the North Pole. And we actually just won a prize for it yesterday creative play awards so you can get this completely free and i'm also going to give you support so i'm sure that will be shared but that's that's the end of mine i will i will stop sharing and i will how do i come out of this stop sharing yes there you go wow wow just wow both of you <laughs> i have got so many notes written down for ideas for various things but gina thank you so much that was incredible what a great follow-on to Deborah. Absolutely, absolutely perfect. Um, just to remind everybody, the presentations will be sent with them with an email with the recording, together with some resources that we've discussed, and also um, Gina's thank you gift as well, the uh, the toy shop at the North Pole. And Gina, once again, a huge congratulations on winning the award yesterday at Creative Play. Really, really proud. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have a few questions. Um, which I'm going to ask, um, starting with uh, Deborah. Um, Deborah, do you have a dedicated area for STEM in your setting or is it embedded throughout? It's um, embedded throughout. I mean, the whole nursery is set up to lend itself to STEM play. So um, we haven't got just one zone that the children would go in that is, that is STEM related. That STEM, the, the uh, resources that facilitate some of the STEM learning and play, they're just everywhere throughout the nursery in high quality zoned um, areas. So our writing area um, you know, will have clipboards and things for children to be able to pick up things to um, record their ideas, draw their designs. Um, the investigation area will have all of the funnels and magnets and all of those sort of things in it so it's generally throughout the whole setting the set because we're a stem focused day nursery our setting is lends itself to um stem inquiry throughout all the all the zones that you can normally find in a nursery very lucky sounds sounds like a great place um another question is coming um privately do you have resources that can help us plan to include in our planning um, and it kind of leads into another question actually which is do you have dedicated STEM discussions in your team to help the team develop ideas together like brainstorming sessions um, how does that how does that work yes so um, our curriculum is emerging um, and our planning uh, behind our curriculum if you like uh, is, is set up in a way in which the practitioners will all um, naturally have to think STEM. So um, just like all the planning that goes on in nurseries, we looking at what the children are interested in, what their fascinations are, um, and for our younger children, any schema that's emerging. And we're using uh, what those children need to learn from their own individual start points um, as obviously the basis for everything that we deliver. And then, then uh, the STEM side comes in because when we look at what those children need to learn, uh, we then think, how can we, what can we do to help those children to learn those things? And how does that link across to something that's STEM? So where we can provide a provocation that is STEM related in response to children's interests, fascinations and learning needs, then uh, the adults will set up something that um, uh, will lend itself beautifully to our 
our STEM, uh, our STEM curriculum. And that plan, planning um, that we are developing is there's links across this, all four areas, science, technology, engineering, and maths are, are on that planning, uh, as well as um, other core areas. So the, the staff will then think about, like we said, what words are we teaching? Uh, why, why are we needing to teach those? Who needs to, lead, who needs to learn which words? Uh, what is their level of understanding in, in terms of question? So they plan sort of uh, all of the experiences with a holistic approach for every child. Thank you. Um, another one's just come in. How can we help parents embrace STEM at home? Can we ask them to collect their rubbish? I know you've had you've had um, a kind of a, a non a non exist or non diminishing selection, haven't you? Boxes and stuff that have just been sent. Yes, we're very lucky. Our parents are on board. We share the learning with the parents um, each week. So we give them a little overview of, of what the children are learning and we will make requests. The children actually do it for us. They'll say, I need to take some boxes. And they, you know, they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they nag their parents. Uh, one of our parents came in the other day and said, if I have to make one more rocket before we're allowed out of the house in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, isn't it? It's just getting that narrative. It's just yes. getting the narrative going, and the children will will, will follow, I guess. Um, so, so yeah, so they very much the parents um, at home learning side of things. The parents are involved. We are lucky where we are based. We are based right next to AstraZeneca, Adam Brooks Hospital, Faber Institute. So most of our parents um, are from backgrounds that are in STEM, and so we got a lot of support from the parents for for what we're delivering. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question that's come in is if maths, you, you spoke early on about how maths is so central to STEM, it's the thing that, that pretty much holds it all together. How then is it, how do you then focus on, uh, on the other elements if a child seems to be maths weak or doesn't seem to have a, a natural aptitude for the maths? Can you, do you overcompensate on the other areas or does you just kind of combine it all? You, it's a holistic look at each child. Um, we know that um, children develop at different rates, at different paces, and they have passions for different things. So, you know, each planning um, is comes from that child. Each child is unique. You know, that unique child very much feeds through our ethos, as do all of those guiding principles, so that we create a unique curriculum for each and every child. And if they need um, maths at a different level, if they need a chance to rehearse and, and relearn, they'll get that um, through, through whatever play uh, they are demonstrating to us they want to take part in. Okay, thank you. Um, some questions have come in for Gina as well, but a couple of, I think they've come in from, from you, uh, for you as well, Deborah. So I'll stick with you if that's, if that's okay. Um, how do you bring STEM into in the moment planning? Uh, again, because we very much, um, it's about those practitioners um, looking for those opportunities in their everyday play to, to um, deliver uh, STEM thinking and, and, and to build that science capital. You can do it in the moment because if you're, one of the biggest things I've tried to bring across is that it isn't the activity that makes it STEM, it's what you do with the activity that counts. So it's your interaction and how you interact with those children and how you encourage them to observe, notice, um, and to uh, identify a problem and problem solve uh, that's important. So when you're playing alongside those children in the moment and you're bringing in uh, those activities that those children are wanting to do and enhancing them in that moment, you can very much make sure that you are uh, pitching those those skills um, and encouraging the children to take part in, in, those, in that STEM learning. It's not about getting out a specific activity and thinking it's not STEM unless I deliver the elephant toothpaste experiment today. That's not what STEM is. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I've got a couple of questions for Gina, but Deborah, if you don't mind standing, being on standby as well, in case any other um, any others come in. Um, Gina, do you have any resources? I know you've spoken about the the um, the, the North Pole, um, but do you have any resources that that we can use to help our staff encourage imagination and creativity? Um, how do we how do we kind of um, how do we really get them to embrace that creativity when we're talking about these areas? 
everything that we do, we have all those resources. We have everything from under the sea to the moon, rockets on the moon. What we do is we supply you with the resources, the, the settings of the resources, the training and the support to encourage and encourage the, your team members to have fun because if they're having fun and enjoying it the children will become engaged and they will enjoy it and then that will link and springboard into all of your stem activities so as i said you're wrapping it up it's all about giving the settings that spark of imagination as well so we've done all of the work and all the planning for you over 18 years of it <laughs> and also even pre we eyfs we were piloting and trying it out no we have everything there for you including the language the vocab that you can add in and do you know what I'm going to do now I'm going to add in the stem language as well <laughs> to, to make that life easier to make it even easier because we know that you're also time poor at the moment that you just don't have that time to go out and struggle and it is a lot of in the moment yes you do your planning but we have everything for you there we have all the resources so anyone just just contact me. It's all there for you. Thanks, Dina. <laughs> Obviously, we'll put all the contact details on the email. Um, I know you've just recently returned from uh, from India. We do have a, a lady from India on the call today. For Hindola's uh, joined us, and she's just put here. Wanted to to let you know, Gina. She's really honoured to be here today. Imagination and fiction both are having some invisible base now to manifest into reality. Um, she's a quantum physics fan, by the way, and one quote she remembers from Carl Sagan, evidence of lack, evidence of lack is not lack of evidence. When you were showing your imagination example, she just wanted to bring that, bring that to the, to the floor on that. Big, big fan of Carl as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And as when I was in India, it's very interesting. There's a very much a focus on the STEM without the imagination and the creativity. So, Dola, absolutely this will be fabulous for your children to get them to become those innovators, those scientists of the future. She I does ask one more question, actually, Gina, for, for you. Um, to develop ethics and assistance in solving ethical dilemmas in day-to-day -day life, do you have any ideas how that can be integrated? And I know she, she um, I know she's particularly interested in that. Yeah. What, um, what we do is we take the children into the imaginary world, imaginary problems that they have to solve, and then we bring them back, bring it back into the real world. If that sort of helps, that's what we what we we like to do. We like to sort of get it into what if, what would happen next, what 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 would happen if we did that, and is that the right thing to do? And then we bring it back into the real world. We give the children that freedom to express themselves as well and then come back and then we relate it to everything and, and the ethics and everything and, and being kind to your friends and you know we link it with animals I always have this thing when I see settings they put um, penguins with polar bears I always say they would be extinct if you had penguins with the polar bears <laughs> that's not a good thing to do because <laughs> Deborah going <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Thanks, it's don't put the polar bears with the penguins it's not the right thing it's not an ethical thing to do <laughs> We have two more questions here which are related. Uh, one's from Nihala Zaidi and the other one's from, from Emma, but both both actually pretty much asking the same question. Um, any ideas how to bring STEM learning for the under twos? Any particular resources for the for the little ones? How how do we embrace that? That's that's to both of you actually. Okay, so um I think that um um, people can overcomplicate it when you're thinking about uh, the babies and things like that. I mean, if you want to take, just take for instance, um, a, a, if you wanted to develop the concept of forces with, uh, as a STEM concept um, for, for little ones, you know, it's, it's very simple sensory based uh, learning. So you would just give them um, experiences of water play um, so they can explore the force of water. Um, and, and, and play using that type of thing. Um, you can have slopes and things for them to roll different things down. Um, you can change the textures of the slopes that you've got for the babies to roll things down. So it's about um, remembering to keep it sensory and hands-on on learning. And it's about the more children touch and explore um, their natural world, uh, you're underpinning what will come later. So it's about making sure that those uh, experiences are, are wide and, and, and rooted in uh, developmentally appropriate sensory experiences. Yeah, 
Totally. Thank you, Deborah. Sorry, Gina, do you want to add something? We, we do the same thing as well. We make it sensory. So if we go to the North Pole, we use with thermoception, we grate ice on them wearing an oven glove for ourselves I don't I did that once I got my hand stuck to the ice I didn't wear an oven glove <laughs> so that was experiential learning so all these different things you do you, you know different textures for them for the eggs of my dinosaur we have different different types of balls for them to feel and touch sizes and shapes as well you know um, if we're doing under the sea I, I get hold of these um, big sharks I found this amazing company that has them and they have the um, the multi layers of teeth inside and they can put their finger in, they can feel all of the teeth and the the palate as well of the shark. That sensory thing of feeling a shark as well. All these lovely things that you can do. Under twos, sensory experience, touch, taste and feel. Perfect. Thank you, Gina. That's the end of our questions. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you all for joining us for our November webinar. Um, Deborah, Gina, absolutely incredible. Just really, really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Remember um, that everybody's attended. Once you get the email after the event, that will be later on this afternoon or tomorrow morning, you can apply for your CPD certificate to say that you've attended. It's fantastic for you, uh, for, your, for your professional development. Um, don't forget to join us in December, December the 9th. Our next webinar is all about the three P's, policies, planning and procedures. So uh, invitation will go out uh, shortly for that. But thank you everybody for joining us. And again, ladies, thank you so much. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.